Okay, Jiya. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, this is our second recap lecture on what we had covered before uh, we went off on holidays. Uh, I'm going to make these slides available to you in the Google Classroom so you can follow through uh, while watching the uh, video for this as well. Right. So this um, this uh, lecture is basically concerned about the introduction of project management and the project management framework. We've already talked about this, so I'll just be brief and sort of just quickly give you a recap. Um, and if you have any questions, you can uh, sort of either post your questions or we can have a live session about uh, for, for the purpose of question and answers, right? Um, so uh, the, there's a PEMBOK that we talked about that exists, which is a book uh, written by the Project Management Institute. PEMBOK stands for the project management body of knowledge. And basically, it brings together all that we know about project management um, as a discipline without going into much details, right? It's a standard, so it barely um, touches on the idea without much explanation and leaves it all to other people to uh, sort of follow up with the details by reading uh, textbooks and other type of material, right? So everything that we know about project management and what is important for us as project managers is there in the project management body of knowledge, right? Now, the purpose of this PEMBOK and the PMI are to sort of make uh, project management into a profession, right? So that's a very tricky type of uh, uh, proposal that they have, right? The idea is that there's only a handful of uh, professions out there. For example, medicine is a profession, uh, accounting is a profession, engineering is a profession, and law is a profession. Why are these professions? Because there are professional bodies behind these disciplines. And in order to practice medicine or law or engineering or what have you, these bodies have to approve your credentials and then only can you be allowed to practice that profession, right? So the problem with project management is that up until uh, the PMI got founded, there was no body that allowed for a person to become a professional. That is that there was nobody approving your credentials. So the objective of the PMI is to sort of make project management into a profession. So in order to become a professional project manager, uh, somebody has to qualify uh, that PMI's standardized test. Uh, it's called the PMP, Project Management Professional Exam, and only then they can become professionals, right? So for, for you guys, um, it's a bit tricky because uh, you, you have to fulfill certain requirements in order to sit for the PMI test, uh, which you presently you don't have, right? But I'll uh, just sort of uh, mention some of the requirements and then later on you may become interested and you can actually take the test and become certified project managers. One is that you must have a four-year undergraduate degree, uh, which you presently don't have because you have the process of it. Second is that you must have practiced um, uh, project management for three years. That is, you have work experience for three years on a project. And the third requirement is that you pass the test, right? So eventually you'll uh, accomplish all these three requirements and you can set for the examination. But for right now, we'll just sort of uh, briefly talk about this idea and uh, the process that is there, right? Uh, in, in project management. Right? So the PEMBOK is basically a standard that exists. And very briefly, again, it's a collection of all the tools and techniques and the things that we should know as a project manager in order to become a professional, right? And there's a test based upon that, right? What's the idea behind the PEMBOL? Well, it is to sort of give us an overview of what project management is and also to talk about um, the generally applicable principles of project management that can be applied to most of the projects most of the time. So that's another very interesting idea, which is that you don't really have to have some sort of a relevant degree uh, in order to become a project manager. And, and, and I say that with a grain of salt or with a pinch of salt, which is that, you know, can you really manage a construction project without being a certified civil engineer? Can you really uh, 
you know, manage a project that designs an aircraft or an airplane without knowing anything about aircrafts and airplanes, that is, you're not an aeronautical engineer. Can you really do all these things? So the, the thought is that, yes, you can. And how that happens is that as a project manager, is there to manage the process, right? The project manager is not the technical person. Rather, the thought is that you will hire the relevant qualified people that have the technical skills to do the engineering work for you and the architecture work for you and whatever have you. Uh, and you as a project manager will simply make sure that the uh, timelines and the cost based lines, et cetera, are fulfilled, right? So that's the thought here. So, uh, in, in the um, eyes of the PMI, you could have whatever degree that you have, and then you can become a project manager in whatever type of bank discipline. But that may not be the reality uh, because different governments and different types of sovereignties would have their own rules, uh, et cetera, right? But at least in the US, that's something that doesn't happen. Right? Now, we have looked at the definition of a project in uh, the, the previous lecture, but these are some of the terms that I had thrown at you. One, the project is a temporary endeavor with a definite beginning and a definite end. So it has a starting date and it has a ending date. A project creates something unique and it can create a unique result, it can create a unique service, or it can create a unique product. Right? So we talked about this before also, Unique products would be, for example, bridges or houses or buildings or shopping plazas, et cetera. Unique services would be services that are offered to individuals, such as in the form of uh, uh, customer service trainings, uh, you know, processes are being redefined, uh, some sort of a new uh, welfare scheme is being thought about, something of that nature. So that could also be done in the form of a project. And then also you have results. So uh, that means that projects can also uh, be research-oriented projects, so in which case the end outcome of the research is that you get some sort of a result, right? So you could do a survey, an experiment, a case study, a grounded theory, whatever, and that will come up with certain data. You analyze the data and then you come up with certain conclusions out of that data, and those conclusions are basically the results, right? So projects can happen in three ways. Uh, they can produce products, they can produce services, or they could produce results. Then uh, projects have a purpose. And I said that projects are basically there for one singular purpose, which is for uh, achieving certain strategic aims of an organization, right? In other words, uh, projects are also defined as uh, tools for the implementation of strategy, right? So whatever we do uh, in an organization in the form of a project, there is always some sort of a strategic initiative behind it or some sort of a strategic part behind it, right? And the reason for doing the project is to implement that strategy and realize it. Now, I gave you this idea that all organizations are there for particular purposes, which is for maximizing of the shareholder wealth and whatever activity that an organization performs is specifically for the purpose of sustaining that organization, running that organization and making it profitable. Right? Now, that organization may get a goal in front of them where they may want to change their machinery, upgrade themselves, change themselves for whatever reason. So in order to achieve that, that, pro that organization would sort of launch into a project. Uh, and the idea is that that would be in line with the strategy of the organization. Right? Then I also talked about this idea of interrelated activities where one thing in a project leads to something else, right? So a design leads to, for example, the execution, the requirements lead to the design, right? The uh, scope leads to the time period and the time period leads to the costing of the project. So there's a lot of interrelated uh, activities in them. And projects are progressively elaborated. What that means is that, uh, as I explained before, your planning level uh, moves from an abstract level, from a bird's eye view, slowly and gradually your plan needs to become more uh, developed and more in detail, right? So basically progressively elaborated has this thought behind it, which is that our plans are incrementally made in more and more details, right? So 
there are projects that are temporary. Many projects are there. You see them around. Starting dates are there. Ending dates are there. That's another problem where sometimes the starting date doesn't happen. You start late. The ending date doesn't happen on time. You, you end late. But they do happen, right? Uh, but often, the results that we get from a project may not be temporary. Right? You may have done a project for a particular purpose, but that purpose may change. So for, I give you an example that the Taj Mahal was built as a mausoleum uh, for Mumtaz Mahal, right? But do we still use it for that purpose? Definitely not as being now used as a tourist attraction, right? The Great Wall of China, we made that, somebody made that, but it was for the purpose of defense. So is it still being used for defense? Definitely not. It's being used as a tourist attraction now, right? So uh, projects often do uh, outlive the reason why they came up, right? But what is important is that there are windows of opportunities that open up. From time to time, there's a need that arises that gives rise to that project. And that project has to happen in, in, a, in a given time period in order to uh, take the maximum benefit out of that window of opportunity. So if you get late, that window of opportunity gets shut, and then there's no reason to sort of continue the project, right? So for example, uh, many, many, many years ago, there was no way to make photocopies, rather you had to either take pictures of your uh, uh, documents and send the negatives to people or develop the picture and send them to people. Uh, then lithographs came into the picture, you know, different types of oily type of you know, photocopy things would happen. But eventually Xerox uh, company started this effort of developing a, a photocopy machine. So the, this window of opportunity was open and whoever reached this uh, window of opportunity first and developed that item first into the marketplace, they got, you know, some sort of protection in the form patents and copyright. So for 20 years after the Xerox company made their photo photocopy machine, nobody else could produce a photocopier, right? So uh, the window of opportunity was important because for 20 good years, the Xerox Corporation enjoyed the benefit of that project and the outcome that they received from it. And other people could not come into the marketplace and compete with the Xerox company because they were protected by the patents that they had. After 20 years, then other photocopier machines came into the picture like Canon and Fujitsu and Jujitsu, et cetera, what have you. And other people became competitors in the marketplace and people now had opportunities to buy uh, photocopier machines from companies other than the Xerox Corporation, right? So it's, it's very important that you do that. Uh, now, it's not a usual case where a project is so protracted or so extended that the people that started the project die before the project comes to a conclusion. But seldom uh, this does happen. Specifically, it may happen in the cases where uh, man is trying to set up a colony on Mars. So maybe not. Uh, this may not happen in the in the lifetime of Elon Musk. It may happen after Elon Musk passes away. Uh, but that's a very rare occasion. It doesn't happen. Very right? unique. As I said, everything delivered out of the project, the result of the project, the service of the project, the product of the project is going to be unique in itself, right? And that uniqueness may not be truly unique, but you have to really look for that because the principle is different, the source of funding is different, the time period is different, so in that way there is a bit of uniqueness there. Then projects are progressively elaborated and incremental details are being put in and the project is slowly and gradually being made into more and more detail, right? So that's the idea of progressively elaborate. So these are some of the key words that you should have in your mind, and I would suggest that you memorize them, and the moment somebody says to you what is a project, you should be able to sort of uh, narrate these five things, that these are the five key words for what a project is. And we will, uh, these are from the uh, PMI spam box. So this is the definitive uh, definition of what a project is. So anytime you encounter a project in your life and somebody uses the term project in front of you, you have to check it against these five criteria and say, well, is it temporary? Is it unique? Is there a purpose behind it? Is it does it have interrelated activities? Is it progressively elaborated? And if these five criteria are fulfilled, so then definitely we would 
agree to it and say that it is a project, otherwise we would say it is not, right? Now, the question then is that can we have projects which are comprised of just one individual, the one person themselves as the designer, the implementer, the principal? So of course you can have that, but are we really concerned about projects of that nature? Should we be concerned about them? So definitely we won't be because these are too small uh, and single person individual uh, projects are projects on which we don't normally apply the project management tools and techniques. So we'll sort of forget about them. We are concerned about multi-dimensional, multi-party, multi-individual type of projects and only those are the projects where we want to apply the project management tools and techniques. Right? Now, projects, and operational activities are two things that are happening in an organization. Projects have their own characteristics, and I just gave you the five uh, keywords for what a project is, but there are also operations, right? So regardless of whether you have a project or an operational activity going on in front of you, there are some similarities that exist between the two of them. One is that they are performed by people. So that's a silly thing to say, because of course, who else is going to perform the project? People are going to perform it. Who else are going to manage and run your operations? Of course, people are going to run and, and manage that. But this is a realization that having people means that there's going to be human resource related issues and problems, communication issues, power issues, trust issues, etc. So be ready for those, whether in operations or in projects. But in projects, is more important because the time period that you have, the starting and the ending dates are, are very close to each other. So these things, these trust issues, power issues, you know, politics, all these things are going to happen and they're going to happen in, in more intensity and they are going to happen much more quicker for you in a project as opposed to an operation. Right? At the same time, projects and operations are similar to each other because they're both constrained by limited resources. A project doesn't have unlimited money, an operation doesn't have unlimited money. A project has limited uh, you know, human capital, and an operation has limited human capital. A project has limited capital resources, and uh, an operation also has limited capital resources. Right. So that means that there's going to be a lot of constraints, whether you're working in a project or in an operation, and they have to be managed. And again, the, the time duration, uh, and, and the brevity that exists there is going to make these more problematic in a project as or, or opposed to an operation. And then both are planned, executed, monitored, and controlled. So this is something that's not unique to a project only, both in operations and uh, in projects, there is something similar to this. Now the difference is that operations are ongoing and repetitive. You Once you have an operation, you keep on doing it and you keep on doing it. It's every day you come and you do it and you come and you do the same thing. And the reason is to sort of sustain the organization. So the example of an organization that does things to sustain itself would be uh, a very cheap example, but it would be, or a convenient example, it would be the institute. All these activities that are taking place within I'm science is all about, well, they're all about keeping prime sciences afloat financially and making sure that it doesn't go under, uh, keeping it lucrative, keeping it interesting for the government, keeping you know a, a stream of revenue uh, going so that this organization can continue on and it can get bigger and bigger and create more benefit for the people working there and for the society around it, the customers. Right? On the other side, projects are temporary. They are going to happen for a limited period of time and a certain objective will be achieved and then the project is going to terminate. So if we take the example of the BRT, it is there for a temporary period of time, is going to begin, is going to come to a conclusion. But then what happens with the BRT is that it does not remain as a project, rather it becomes an operational activity and running the buses and managing the stations and the customers and the finances and the human resources is no longer a project, rather it becomes an operational activity. So we can say that projects result in something, right? Something happens, some sort of an objective is achieved, 
But then what you do with that, uh, you know, product outcome, whatever have you, is that it becomes uh, mostly a part of your operational activity. Right? Then we also encounter this idea of a program. A program is going to be a collection of related projects that are managed in some sort of a coordinated way. So all the projects within a program are related to each other. Somehow. They are not different projects. They are all having to do with achieving some sort of a goal. Right? So normally we have programs because we have a big goal to achieve. And achieving that goal through a single project is not um, ideal. So rather what we do is we break it into smaller goals and assign projects to each of these objectives and say, go ahead, right? So each project comes up with its own um, result, their own outcome, and those outcomes combine together to formulate a program. So a program is a collection of related projects managed in a coordinated or in a centralized way, right? So you will have a lot of project managers within the program, and then there's going to be one program manager who overseeing the activities of all the project managers. And, then, and again, the program's objective uh, is also a strategic objective. The benefit that it creates is also uh, having some sort of relationship with some sort of strategy. Right? So an example in our local context is the polio eradication program, the Benazir Income Support Program. I think they've changed the name of it. But you get the idea that these are problems. So within these, there are multiple smaller projects. Then there's a bigger umbrella over and above a program where you may have a much bigger goal uh, that cannot be achieved by one program. So you may have a goal about improving health of people. So what kind of health are you concerned about? So you may have a program about uh, polio, you may have a program about diabetes, about cancer, about heart disease, and then that program would have sub-projects and projects, and the other program would have projects and sub-projects and so forth. So the biggest umbrella is a portfolio, then you've got programs, and in the program you've got projects, and within the projects you've got sub-projects. So this is sort of like a hierarchy that exists, right? Now, I've talked about this briefly uh, before, so I'll just sort of be quick here. The projects are related to strategic objectives and uh, projects are the tools of implementing the strategy of an organization. So uh, there are strategic, strategic planning is, is an important point here. Right? Now, why do projects come into being? What propels these projects? What pushes these projects out into the market? Well, there's uh, five different things that propel these projects. One is a market demand. So the general market doesn't come to you and say, do this for me. Rather, you have to go and survey the market or listen to the market or guess what the market is looking for. And then you may, an organization may decide that they want to launch into a project to cater to that. And so maybe the marketplace of Peshawar is looking for an amusement park. So somebody decides that they want to go into that business and start an amusement. Somebody decides that they want to sort of go into stage decoration for events. So maybe that's a market demand and they want to cater for it, right? So the market comes up with some sort of a need, a demand, and then organizations decide that they want to take care of that demand for the marketplace. So that could be one reason that projects are coming into being. The second reason that project comes into being is that there is an internal need in an organization. So the need may be that organization feels that they've got limited space and they want more space. The need may be that organization feels that they want to change their their advertising or the way that they advertise, right? The need may be that organization wants to change their machinery and upgrade themselves. The need may be that organization wants to get rid of an existing business and launch into a, a complementary or a supplementary type of a business. So whatever internal need there may be in that organization, that could also give rise to a project. Then the third is that somebody shows up at your door, right? And they say, do this for me. Are you willing to do this for me? So that is more of a customer request where somebody has shown up at your place of business and said, well, I see you doing this, but can you do uh, X, Y, Z for me? So you may have a catering company and somebody comes to you and says, I would like to have a barbecue uh, 
you know, dinner for my family. So can you come and arrange that for me and bring your DJ and do this and that for me? So you may decide, okay, you want to cater to that request because that will uh, make you more profitable. So that could also be a project. Uh, the fourth reason is that there's changes in technology taking place. New and new technology is coming out into the marketplace, which may necessitate for you to change, right? So for example, uh, uh, touch screens come into the picture. Now you want to change your computers and get touch screens. So you may launch into a project to buy new computers. Uh, you may decide that your servers are too slow and you want to buy new servers at your workplace. So you may decide to upgrade your IT infrastructure. You may want to introduce gigabit ethernet or some sort of you know, gigabit Wi-Fi or something of that nature. So that would necessitate a, uh, a project. And the last reason that projects come into being is that some sort of a, a law changes and that gives rise to new types of projects so for example in saudi arabia recently the laws have changed and now you can open up a cinema so you maybe somebody decides that they want to be the first one to open up a cinema in saudi arabia so they may decide to launch into a project and take care of right so or something may become suddenly illegal or something may become unsafe right for example suddenly the law may change and the government may decide that all cars that are manufactured locally in pakistan should have airbags in them. so all these uh, toyota company honda company subaru company uh, sorry this uh, kia corporation and whatever companies that are making cars here in Pakistan, they'll have to change their setup so that they could introduce the, uh, the new legal requirement uh, catered to that, which is to have uh, airbags in the cars or whatever. Right? So these are five reasons why projects are coming about. So what is then project management? Well, it's basically an application of what we know, uh, the skills that we have, the tools that we have developed over the years, those two projects so that we could successfully implement the project. Right? Now, what happens in project management is that we have to identify the requirements. So if it's a, a customer coming to us and saying, do this for us, so we need to capture the requirements quite clearly. Right? So we have to capture the requirements of the customer. The second thing that happens in project management is that goals have to be set up and these goals have to be clear and they have to be achievable right so we're not going to say that we're uh, going to design a house uh, that is going to be comfortable because how do you measure comfortable right but saying that we're going to design a house that's going to have four rooms and here's the size of the room and here's the location of it and we're going to do it in six months time well that's a very clear and perhaps achievable goal right so the goals have to be clear and achievable we don't want ambiguous unmeasurable type of goals in a project environment we want to have uh, limited goals we want to have them to be clearly stated and we want them to be quantifiable somehow and we want them to be achievable and then at the same time as a project manager what we're trying to do is we're balancing what are we balancing well we're balancing the iron triangle the project management triangle uh, right uh, that is quality is in the middle scope time and cost surrounds there so any type of changes in the scope the time period and the budget of the project are going to have an effect upon the quality. So we're going to make sure that as a project manager, we don't go about uh, damaging uh, the quality of the uh, product, service, or result that we're producing, right? So we have to ensure that that happens. Right? And then we have to make sure as project, uh, uh, while managing a project, that we are adaptive, right? As things change, unexpected things are going to pop up, new type of problems and concerns are going to arise. So we need to adapt our plans accordingly so that the project doesn't become stale and stuck, rather it continues, right? So what kind of uh, adaptation may be necessary? Well, there's this idea of stakeholders, right? So people who are somehow directly or indirectly affected by the project. So if we miss the key stakeholder and later on that key stakeholder shows up and says, well, you didn't capture my requirements, there are my requirements. 
So that means that the project, well, number one, is they didn't do the right job because they missed a key stakeholder. But if if changes happen, a uh, project should be able to sort of adapt uh, their specifications and their plans so that we can meet the expectations of these different types of stakeholders. Right? Internal stakeholders, external stakeholders, we have to make sure that we manage them. Then this is a very funky idea. Uh, some people actually really like this idea of project management and they become so interested in, in the tools, techniques, and skills of project management that they decide that they want to apply that upon their operational activity. So even though you may not have a project in front of you, you may decide to use the project management tools and techniques and manage uh, your operational activities as if they were projects, right? So the operational activity of the Institute of Management Sciences is an ongoing activity. So every year people come, people graduate, you know, classes happen. That's an operational activity. But what if we start thinking about each project, uh, uh, each semester as a project, so then uh, we can apply the project management tools and techniques to a semester. And if we're doing that, that is known as management by project. So you don't really have a project, but you may decide to use the uh, concept of project management on your operational activities. Right? Now, the triple constraint idea is there. Here's the triple constraint. Cost on the left side, scope on the right side, time at the bottom. You can move them around. Right, we were just referring to this figure, and quality is, is, is in the middle. So, the cost, scope, time, they're all pushing and pulling upon the quality. So, the role of yours as a project manager is to make sure that you don't violate the quality, right? So, there's this competing demand of scope, cost, and time. All the time, they are affecting or pushing and pulling upon the quality. So, your role as a project manager is to defend the quality. Right. So there's three uh, constraints there, scope, time, and cost. Other literature has uh, used some different terminology for it. They have called it a scope, schedule, resources, which are pretty much the same idea as the scope, time, and cost. Uh, and yet, in other places, uh, the term triple constraint is used, but there's a few more constraints thrown in. So there's a traditional scope, time, cost, quality, but they also add the idea of customer satisfaction and risk into it. Uh, yet they still call it as triple constraints, but for yours and my purposes, we'll stick to the first one that the triple constraints in the project management triangle are the cost, the scope, the time, and what are they constraining or limiting are basically the quality of it, right? So I'll, I'll skip this one. This one doesn't have to do anything with you uh, as yet, right? So let's skip that. Now, there's different levels of expertise that we must have in order for us to manage a project better. And there must, in us as project manager, be a couple of expertise present. One is that at least we should understand what the project management body of knowledge is. Uh, for you guys, because we're not, uh, I'm, I'm using these slides from some training that I've conducted, so they're not specifically customized for your class. So I'm not going to talk much more about the PMI as an idea, but at least, you know, we should be familiar with what project management is all about and what happens in project management, right? So that's one level of expertise that you have. Number two, we have to understand that there is a difference between the two terms that are there on this bullet point number two, which is a standard and a regulation, right? So if there are standards out there, it's a choice. We may decide to follow the standard or we may decide to not follow the standard. So in other words, we may decide to follow the PMI's PMBOK as a standard or we may not decide. We may decide to follow the IEEE's project management standard, or we may decide not to follow it. We may decide to follow the Project Management Institute of Japan standard, or we may decide not to follow it. We may decide to follow the Association of Project Management's standard, or we may decide not to follow it. Why do we have this option? Because standards are optional. They are not not follow a standard or you may decide not to follow it. But having a standard, if it exists, following it is going to make your life much more easier as opposed to having no standard and then coming up with your own 
processes and your own ways of managing a project uh, is going to be difficult because there's a great uh, chance of making mistakes and ruining your project, right? So if there's a standard somewhere, my recommendation would be is to adopt the standard and sort of use that. If there's no, no, no standard out there, then the choice is yours. You may decide to do it or not. But certain countries have made certain standards into regulations. They have regulated them and they have made it a law that these standards have to be followed. So if you then, in that case, don't follow the standard, which is by that time a regulation, you are doing something illegal, right? So if something is a regulation, it has to be done in a particular way and the government is going to regulate it, that is that they're going to come and place checks and balances upon you. So if you don't do it in that way, it's going to be illegal and they'll catch you, right? So keep that in mind. There are different standards out there. Following them is optional. Uh, if you follow it, you are in court, right? So here's an example. Here's my iPhone as what is the port under air, which is used for charging. So it requires a specific type of a charger. I can't use somebody else's charger. I have to use iPhone charger, right? So had they followed the standard and used the normal uh, C-type charger, uh, then I wouldn't have to buy an iPhone charger for it, and my life would be easy. But Apple decided that they don't want to find uh, follow that standard, so that's up to them. Um, the European Union has decided to regulate the charging ports of the mobile phones, and they're saying that you have to have a C-type uh, port, otherwise you can't sell your phones in the European Union any longer. So uh, the future Apple iPhones that are going to come, they must follow then the C-type charger port because it's become regulated in the European Union, and if they want to sell their phones there, they have to, right? So that's the idea behind the standard and the regulation. Um, thirdly, we have to understand the project environment. Well, what do we mean by the environment? Well, uh, there's two types of environments. There's the external environment, and then there's the internal environment. So the external environment uh, is not a very simple thing, Well, there's the political environment political environment in the sense whether it's a kingship or it's a democracy or it's a dictatorship or what, what form of a government is there. So you have to understand the political environment. You have to understand the social environment. Is it a, a closed uh, type of environment? Is it an open environment? Is it a, a you know, sort of an environment where people are highly dependent upon each other? Is it a type of environment where people are more independent uh, than each other, you know, what are the norms, the culture, the values, etc. You have to understand sort of like the, the geophysical environment, is it a mountainous terrain, is it a flat terrain, is it a hot weather environment, is it a cold weather environment, and so forth, and so on. Uh, and then you also have to understand the internal uh, project environment. Right, so what kind of an environment is there within your company? Is it a tall hierarchy? Is it flat hierarchy? Is it wide? Is it you know what what type of a setup do you have? So uh, in order to effectively manage a project, the project manager has to understand both the internal and the external environment. Right, and you must have management knowledge and you must have management skills. So you must know. What to uh, what conflict is all about? How it arises? What are some of the techniques where how do negotiations take place and so forth? And you must have the skills to do it. You must know what public speaking is all about. How you know formal communication and informal communication takes place in an organization. And you must be able to apply these skills. You must know what what CPM is, and you must know how to apply it. Right. So you must have some management skills. And also you must have some very good communication skills because most of project management is about talking to people and getting information and providing information. So there's different types of expertise that you may have, right? So standards, uh, what are they well, and who makes them? Well, different standardized bodies come up with standards. So for example, the Chartered um, Accountants Institute of Pakistan comes up with the accounting standards in, in their domain. The ACCA comes up with the accounting standards in their domain. The, uh, I don't know if uh, Bar Association comes up with the legal standards and the uh, 
Pakistan Medical and Dental Council comes up with their own standards, right? So in that way, uh, these are, are created. So who creates them? Well, the experts in those domains come together and by consensus, they develop it. And then there is a voting process that takes place. And then the standard is um, sort of agreed upon. And then it's up to you whether you want to follow it or you don't. Right, so that's how standards come into uh, being. Right, what's the regulation? Well, regulations are sort of regulated by the government. It could be the local government. It could be the, uh, you know, the national government. And they come up and they pass certain laws and they make uh, compliance mandatory. And if you don't comply with these standards, you're going to get yourself into trouble. Right, so building ports is an example of regulations. You can have certain height of buildings. Right, recently there was a change that took place in the Cantonment Board fish hours uh, regulations, and now they're going to allow buildings that are taller than 10 stories high in the Kent area. So now you can have a 30 story high building or a 100 story high building in the Cantonment area. Right, so a regulation got passed and now it's allowed, but before that. Uh, you were regulated. You could build a five-story building, but you couldn't build a six-story building, as an example. So it was regulated, right? Um, standards become accepted by the practitioners in the field. So the more prevalent the standard is, the more people follow it. The more people that follow the standard, the more easier life becomes for them, right? So again, this is option, right? Uh, the project environment also has cultural uh things that has social perspectives and international perspective time zone differences and things of that nature political environment which type of a government do you have is there a law and order situation is the environment a corrupt environment is it an ethically you know working environment what type of you know norms and regulations all these things and then the physical environment which is basically concerned about the geography and the way of the land Right. Um, understand basically in the culture environment how projects uh, affect people and how people affect projects. Right? Uh, for example, in the Mangla uh, Dam project, there was uh, people involved in their villages and homes were going to be submerged by the dam. So uh, because the government didn't really understand the requirements of these people and how the project was going to affect them back in the 1960s. A bunch of people migrated from Pakistan to the United Kingdom uh, because of the social pressure uh, and the social issues. Right? Um, then recently, the Mangla Raising Dam project took place, and again, more houses were going to go under, and there was again a lot of problems with the Mangla Tarakiyati Adara, and you know, a lot of issues arose. So, understanding how your project affects the people and how people affect these projects is going to be important. So we can take again the example of the BRT and we can uh, you know, wonder how the BRT is going to affect the people and how these people are going to affect the BRT. So if people don't decide to use the BRT, is it going to be a successful project? Definitely not, it's going to fail. So we have to understand that, right? So look at the uh, cultural instead. Uh, and understand the organizational culture, which means, you know, how is authority perceived and how do people behave with other persons in positions of authority. So I, as an example, if you're in the military uh, and you don't understand their culture, can a major talk back to what the brigadier says to them or can a brigadier talk back to a general? So definitely not because it's a very autocratic type of a environment. So that culture is different than a democratically run organization where people at lower positions uh, may be free to provide their opinions to people and higher positions. Right? So I'll skip this one. This is not important. And the physical environment includes the local ecology. So by ecology, we mean uh, the plants and the animals that live there and the physical geography. That means, you know, are you close to a major city? Are you in the peripheries? Are you far away in the mountains somewhere and accessibility and, you know, is it a desert environment? Is it a pool environment and so forth? So why do we know we need to know this? Because we have to make sure that we protect our workers um, sufficiently so that they don't become sick or die on us and the difficulties that we face there. Right? And then there's general management skills that we should have when we should know 
to make plans. We should know how to organize our, uh, you know, uh, project, and then we need to learn how to staff people and put them into those organizational hierarchy. We need to know how to execute the projects. We need to know how to control for problems and issues and so forth. We need to know a little bit about finance and. Accounting. We need to know how to do the procurement processes. We need to do a little bit of sales and marketing, and you know, talk good about our project and sell our ideas to people. We need to do contracts and contracting laws and regulations. We need to understand the supply chain and how distribution of goods and material happens. And we need to have some knowledge of strategies and tactics. And we need to have knowledge of how to manage human resources and information technology and so on, right? So this is an endlessly long list and you can add more things, but the more you know about the business, the better off you're going to be in managing projects, right? Now, interpersonal skills are there. Interpersonal skills involves effective communication. Effective communication means that you are able to get your message across to the person. So whatever you have in your mind, you put it in some sort of uh, language or a media and you transfer that to the other person and listen to it or read it and then they digest it. So whatever you have in, in your mind, you should be able to communicate that message across to the other person. Right? You should be able to influence the organization in which you're working because you're going to try to gain access to different types of resources. And if you can't gain these resources uh, and, and sort of exercise your influence, you're not going to be able to achieve the project goals well. So we need to exercise that influence to get things done. We need to show leadership. So we need to show vision, strategy, and we need to get our people you know, behind us and motivate them and you know, keep them going. So that requires good managerial and, and motivational skills and leadership skills to be there. So project management uh, or managers should be good leaders, good ma motivators, and good managers. Uh, we should have good negotiation and conflict management skills. So we should know what a win-win is, a win-lose is, a lose-lose type of a scenario is. We should know what forcing is and what compromises are and you know what withdrawal is and so forth. So all these techniques are uh, the, the conflict and the negotiation techniques. So we should be familiar with them. And if you're dealing with village type of people, you should also sort of understand how the jirga works in, in this local context because you may have to engage in different types of jirga. Uh, if you're in the Punjab side, then you need to know the rules and regulations of how a Punjab works, right? And these are sort of alternate ways of coming up with some sort of a decision uh, to remove a dispute, right? So can we do a jirga uh, and not do a court case type of a thing? Or, you know, what kind of things can we do a jirga about versus what kind of things if we do a jerga about are going to be illegal. So we need to be clear about those things. Right? And we need to be uh, able to solve problems and we need to uh, look at the situations that we are encountering and based upon uh, the situation, um, uh, the actions that we take are going to be different. Right. So that means that there will be um, a, a contingent management taking place right? or based upon uh, scenario to scenario, our management is going to differ, right? And then we, we should have contingencies. We should have plan Bs with us. So if plan A doesn't materialize, what is your plan B? How are you going to make sure that the project takes place? So we should have some skills about that, right? Now, projects are, are happening in uh, this hierarchy and uh, we talked about that hierarchy before right so there's the strategic plan and then there's portfolios and then within them we have our programs and within them we have our projects and then we have our uh, sub projects and so forth and there are uh, other people involved in these pictures right so you've got pro project managers program manager portfolio managers and you may even have uh, some sort of centralized process uh, for coordinating the activities of all the projects together, which is known as the PMO. So we need to have some know-how about that, right? So uh, I think we're 
I'm not going to talk much about portfolio management and program management in more detail, but let's talk a little bit about the project management office. So the first thing that we need to understand is that a project management office could just be one individual performing that role, or it could be a designated office. So either way, we can have a PMO in a nominal project uh, as opposed to an exceptional project, which would definitely have a what does the PMO do is that it links the project manager with the sponsor, the highest authority in, in that uh, uh, concept of a project who gives roles to the project and say, uh, go ahead and become a project manager and do this project. Right? So the PMO is, is the link between the uh, sponsor and the project manager. So the project manager talks to the sponsor uh, through the PMO. And any type of facilitation and help that the project manager requires, that happens via the sponsor through the PMO. Right. So the PMO uh, or the project management office is uh, an authority that works under the upper management. It is centralized and it is coordinated. So it coordinates the activities of multiple projects for our purposes. Let's get rid of the idea of programs and portfolios for now. So it coordinates the activities of all the projects together. Now, what does it do? It provides uh, you with training if you need training. It provides your staff with training if you need that. If you need a project management software, that would be available there. If you need access to standards, policies, and procedures, that would be there. If you have some old project-related templates and you know, tools and techniques that you want to have a look at, those would be uh, there in the PMO, so it acts as a centralized repository. Uh, it is directly responsible for the success of all the projects. So if a project is not working well, uh, the first person responsible for that is going to be the project manager who is going to be answerable to the PMO. So the PMO is going to be ensuring that the project manager is doing all that he or she is supposed to be doing. Right? The PMO is a stakeholder. Uh, and it is a one of the most important stakeholders in, in a project other than the principal. Uh, and it's a key decision maker. So the PMO can decide to uh, cancel the project at any time that it likes. The PMO can decide to shut down the project if it likes, right? So it's a very important stakeholder uh, and their requirements also have to be uh, captured as well. Uh, the PMO can make recommendations to the project manager to do certain things in a certain way. And because it's a uh, higher up in the authority level, so the project manager has to follow uh, what the PMO suggests to it. And the PMO can take people from one project, move them to another project, and vice versa. It can take resources from one project and move it to another. It can take funds from one project and pump it into another project, and, and so forth. So the PMO sort of governs this, right? So this is something that we are not concerned about. So let's skip this slide. Um, there are some additional features of the PMO, so I'll just leave them. Uh, up momentarily so you can sort of read about them, but this is just additional knowledge. You don't have to worry too much about these uh, for now. Um, and uh, there's a difference between project managers and PMOs. Some, sometimes people get concerned, okay, what does a PMO do versus what a project manager does, but this is not a part of our curriculum for, for the moment. So I'll just sort of uh, leave these in the slides if you want to read uh, this, that's up to you, but I'm not going to um, hold you to that, right? So um, that uh, is the end of our second uh, recap lecture. And I'll make this one available to you in your Google Classroom. And then uh, sometimes, perhaps next week, we can uh, schedule or over the weekend, we can schedule a Q&A session with each other. So if you need to ask any questions, then you, are feel, you can feel free to ask them. Uh, but in the meantime, I would recommend that you please go to these slides and go to the first lecture that I provided to you and go to the second lecture as well. Um, and also maybe, uh, you know, dive into the book that was provided to you, um, uh, the project management book that we have, and look up these topics in that book so you can uh, clear up the concepts for yourself even further. Um, so thank you so very much for uh, watching this video, right? Take care.